Hello, I'm Dr. Carnes, and I'm going to be talking to you today about colorectal cancer and how you can prevent it. The objectives are to answer a few questions. Who gets colon cancer and why? What is my risk for getting colorectal cancer? How can I reduce my risk for colorectal cancer? How do I choose the best screening test? How often do I need to get screening? And what should I look for in a specialist or center? Um, key facts about colorectal cancer in 2015, it ranks second behind lung cancer as a cause of cancer deaths. But among non-smokers, colon cancer prevents or um, replaces lung cancer as the number one cancer killer. One in 20 people will get colorectal cancer in their lifetime without screening. We know that polyps are the precursors to almost all colorectal cancers and over half of us will develop polyps by the time we're age 70. Most precancerous polyps provide a nice 10-year window of opportunity before they become cancer. That's the time when they can be found and removed. And up to 90% of colorectal cancers can be prevented through lifestyle changes and the removal of these precancerous polyps. Colonoscopy is the gold standard for finding these polyps, and it's the only test we have that allows us to remove them. But unfortunately, 40 to 50% of us still don't get recommended screening. Risk factors for colorectal cancer include things that we can't change, such as our age, gender, race, and family history, and things that we can change, including how much we exercise, our diet, our weight, and our lifestyle. Colon cancer increases the older we get. In other words, the longer you have the, your colon, the more likely it is you're going to get colon cancer. As you can see from this slide, it begins to increase at about age 50. Males are a little bit more common, are more likely to get colon cancer than females. If you have a gene that actually predisposes you to getting colon cancer, your risks could be very high. With familial adenomatous polyposis, shown in the top curve, the risk approaches 100% by age 70. Race also matters. Uh, African Americans have the highest rate of colorectal cancer, followed by Native Americans and Native Alaskans, followed by whites, Asian and Pacific, and Hispanics seem to have the lowest risk. Now, we all think that family history is a big deal, and it is a big deal in colorectal cancer. But if we look at all the cancers diagnosed, 75% of these people have no family history of colon cancer. The remaining 25% do, and a small percentage of those, 5% overall, have hereditary colon cancer caused by a specific gene. The lifetime risk if you have no family history of getting colon cancer is about 5%, but the range is anywhere from 2 to 14%. If you have a family history of colon cancer, your lifetime risk is about 10%, but the range could be anywhere from 5 to 27%. If you have a gene that you're born with that predisposes you to colorectal cancer, again, your risk could be as high as 100 percent. But the, <clears throat> the, the overall risk really depends on what the syndrome is that you're born with and could range anywhere from 10 to 100 percent. Much of this huge range in each of, these sub, each of these categories is related to modifiable risk factors. In other words, things that you can change in your life that can reduce your risk of colon cancer. If you're this guy on the left, he doesn't exercise, he's obese, he drinks too much, he smokes too much, he has type 2 diabetes, and he eats a lot of red meat and processed meats, your risk of getting a colorectal cancer could be increased by nearly threefold, and you could have a 27% chance of getting it if you had a family history as well. If you're this woman on the right, who exercises, takes aspirin, folic acid, calcium, fiber supplements, and eats plenty of fruit and vegetables, your risk could be reduced by 60% or 0.4 times <clears throat> what your risk would otherwise be. Well, how does colon cancer to develop? It develops in the lining of the colon, which is a single layer of cells um, in, on the surface of the colon that then folds in in these pits, as you can see here. At the base of the pits are stem cells. These are the cells from which all of the cells of your colon come from. And there are stem cells in each of the pits of our colon. 
the stem cells divide. They grow and move up the crypt. Then instructions tell the cells to stop growing, to start doing their job, which might be to absorb, absorb um, <clears throat> fluid and electrolytes or secrete mucus. And then once they reach the top of the crypt, they're programmed to die through a process called apoptosis. And this entire process only takes three days. Well, as you can imagine, if anything goes wrong with these processes, uh, you could develop a colorectal cancer. And we do know that genes control all of these processes and that mutations to these genes are what causes colon cancer. So <clears throat> as colon cancer, or as polyps develop, grow, turn into cancer, and then spread, there's an accumulation of mutations to a variety of genes. Mutations may Mutations to these genes may tell the cells to keep growing when they should be stopping, fail to die, or detach, invade, migrate, and disseminate. Here's some examples of colon polyps. These are benign, and as you can see, they're all shapes and sizes. They can be as small as one or two millimeters or as large as three or four inches before they become cancer but you can never predict on the, based on the size of a polyp whether there may or may not be cancer there. The risks of developing a cancer in a polyp increase as the polyp gets larger. Here's some examples of colorectal cancers. And what's sad about these cases is they were all benign polyps five to 10 years ago. So there's a window of opportunity we have to prevent colon cancer. And that occurs before the cancer develops. Early on, during the first 50 years of our life, if we practice primary prevention, in other words, reduce the modifiable risk factors for colon cancer, we can reduce the chances of getting polyps and cancer. Once we have polyps, there's really only one way to prevent that cancer from forming, and that's to find the polyp and get it out. Keep in mind that even if you're perfect in your modifiable risk factors, like Dr. Oz, you could still get a colorectal polyp so here's this window of opportunity for prevention of colon cancer before the cancer develops. Well, how do we go about preventing colon cancer or trying to find it early enough so that it doesn't kill us? We do that by screening. And we basically have three different ways we can screen. We can focus on preventative screening techniques, early detection screening techniques where we're trying to find cancer early, or we can just simply wait for symptoms Prevention, again, occurs during the earliest phases of colon cancer development up to the polyp phase but before the cancer phase. Early detection occurs when colon cancer has formed but is, has not um, advanced or spread to the point where your survival is significantly in, um, reduced. As you can see on the, on the right side of the slide, colon cancer as it grows, begins to invade and spread, the chances of survival go down dramatically. Up to stage three colon cancer, where the cancer has escaped to the lymph nodes but not elsewhere, surgery still gives you a 75% chance of cure. If you wait for symptoms, that usually means the colon cancer has become very large, it's starting to obstruct or it's starting to bleed, if you wait until then, there's a 50-50 chance you will not be cured with surgery. Here are some examples of some screening tests available to us. Um, fecal tests just test your stool. They test for blood or they test for abnormal DNA. There's radiographic tests, um, which the most common, commonly used now is the CT colonography or the virtual colonoscopy, which can actually reproduce your colon in three dimensions and allow the radiologist to see polyps in your colon virtually. And then there's endoscopic techniques such as colonoscopy that allows us to actually look at the polyp and remove the polyp. Fecal screening tests include the fecal occult blood tests or the hemocult test. Many of us are familiar with taking stool and putting it on a little card, sending it in to the doctor to be tested for blood. If these are done every one to two years, there has been shown to be a reduction in colon cancer-related deaths by 15 to 33 percent. These techniques do not 
uh, find polyps very well. The fecal occult blood test finds polyps about 10% of the time and colon cancer about 50% of the time. If you have a positive test and then have a colonoscopy, the chances that a cancer will actually be found is only 2 to 5%. The FIT test is a newer stool blood test that is more sensitive and specific. It uh, can find polyps 15 to 30 percent of the time and colorectal cancer 65 to 75 percent of the time. Um, we still don't know how well it reduces cancer-related deaths because it hasn't been around long enough for us to know that. And then finally, the newest test on the block is the stool DNA test or Cologuard. This is a stool test that looks for mutations uh, in the stool that are, that, uh, are sh um, that come from shed colon cancer cells. Uh, this is done every two years. It's a little better at finding polyps. Up to 50% of the polyps can be found with this test. And it's a little better at finding cancer as well. Up to 95% of the cancers can be found. CT colonography, that's a test that we would perform every five years, is comparable to colonoscopy for finding polyps if they're bigger than about five millimeters. It misses flat polyps. It requires a good quality prep, just like colonoscopy. It also requires radiation exposure. And a positive result warrants you getting a colonoscopy to find the abnormality seen on the CT colonography to see if it's something that needs to be removed. So here, <clears throat> here's a slide that basically puts all these things together. If your primary interest is preventing colon cancer, you're going to reduce your, modi your modified risk factors early on. And then you're going to choose either a colonoscopy or you're going to choose a CT colonography. And if it's positive for something, then get your colonoscopy. If your choice is to go with early detection, you'll do fecal testing with any of the three fecal tests that I mentioned, the FIT being the most commonly used today. If positive, you'll get your colonoscopy. And if colonoscopy actually finds the cancer, you, you'll go on to surgery. If you choose to wait for symptoms, then once you have your symptoms, obviously, you'll go straight to colonoscopy. And hopefully, if there is a cancer there causing your symptoms, the surgery will be able to cure you. But again, there's only about a 50% chance that's going to happen. As you can see, all of these, the common denominator is colonoscopy. So <clears throat> with the advent of screening that began back in the uh, mid-1980s, there's been a decrease in the incidence of colorectal cancer shown in the red line at the top of this slide. As the incidence of colorectal cancer, or as the, as the frequency of screening has increased, the incidence of colorectal cancer has dramatically decreased. We know that colonoscopy prevents colon cancer from a number of studies, but the most important of which was the National Polyp st Study in 1993 which showed a 70 to 90 percent reduction in the expected incidence of colorectal cancer in those who had colonoscopy. Twenty years later, participants in this study were looked at again, and those that participated with colonoscopy had a 53 percent reduction in the expected deaths ca um, caused by colon cancer. So today, we know that 91 to 93 percent of new colorectal cancers occur in people who have not had a colonoscopy within the last five years. Whereas 7 to 9% of new colorectal cancers diagnosed occur in people who have had a colonoscopy within the five years. These are called interval cancers. And it's one of the things we as colonoscopists really want to put a lid on. So why do people get interval colon um, colorectal cancer? You've had your colonoscopy. The the colonoscopist may or may not have found polyps. They've told you, come back in five years or come back in 10 years. What happened? Why did I end up getting colon cancer within five years? Well, there's four possible explanations. The colonoscopist may have missed a polyp or a cancer in your colon. They may not have removed your polyp entirely and left some behind. It may be that the pathologist misread the polyp or it may be that polyps can form into cancer just that quick, in between two colonoscopies just five, five years apart. Well, most investigators believe that 
the greatest number of interval cancers occur because we miss them as colonoscopists or we don't remove those polyps well enough. That's 85% of interval cancers are the responsibility of the colonoscopist. So the quality of your colonoscopy really does matter. What are your risk factors of getting a colorectal cancer? We know that if you had a colonoscopy and the exam was not complete, in other words, it didn't reach the top of your colon, your odds of get, getting an interval cancer are increased by sevenfold. It also matters who's doing your colonoscopy. If they're not gastro, gastroenterology trained, they, um, the risk of interval cancers do tend to be higher, such as with rural surgeons, family practitioners, internists, and urban surgeons. <clears throat> adenoma detection rate is the colonoscopist's new batting average. Well, what are adenomas? Adenomas are precancerous polyps. The adenoma detection rate is the percent of screening colonoscopies in which one or more of these adenomas is found. So a colonoscopist wants to have a high batting average or a high ADR. The national average adenoma detection rate is in 25% of screening colonoscopies adenomas will be found. But it's extremely variable between colonoscopists. Some colonoscopists only find, find uh, adenomas in 10% of their screening cases, whereas others may find adenomas in up to 50% of their screening cases. It's estimated that the true adenoma prevalence is probably greater than 50%. GI docs do have the highest performance. But it's, and it's not, it should be comforting to know that coming to an academic center where you may have a GI fellow who's a GI trainee performing your colonoscopy, it seems to have no effect on the adenoma de detection rate. Well, adenoma detection really matters. Um, this is a large study done by the Kaiser uh, group showing that the highest adenoma detection rate is associated with the lowest interval cancer rates. As you can see over on the right side of the slide, there's a group of 12 colonoscopists who had very high adenoma detection rates uh, ranging between 34 and 53 percent, those people had a reduced risk of interval cancer of, near, of uh, about 0.22 to 0.65. So <clears throat> what do you look for in a colonoscopist? Well, your colonoscopist should assure that you're getting the best possible prep, because if your prep isn't good enough, they're not going to find polyps. A split-dose prep is better than a single-dose prep, and four liters is better than lower volumes. Um, the last dose of a split dose prep should be taken five hours prior to the procedure. Your colonoscopist should have a good cecal intubation rate. The cecal intubation rate is the rate at which they get to the top of the colon. In other words, they've seen all of your colon. It should be greater than 95%. Your colonoscopist should take care to look behind every fold use irrigation to wash off mucus and debris, and take time in withdrawal. And in fact, we've, we've found that if withdrawal time is less than six minutes, adenoma detection rate is much lower. Every colonoscopist should also record the prep quality in the report and recommend an early repeat colonoscopy if your prep wasn't very good. They need to know their ADR and achieve an ADR greater than 30%, that's adenoma detection rate, and have a repertoire of skilled polypectomy techniques so they know how to get even the big ones out. They should follow the guidelines for screening and surveillance. And here's some examples of <clears throat> when we should, are the recommendations for first screening colonoscopy. For average risk non-African Americans, we should begin screening at age 40. This is for average risk individuals. If you're African American, some societies are recommending starting at age 45 because your risk of getting colon cancer is higher and getting colon cancer earlier. If you have a family history of colorectal cancer or advanced polyps, you should start at age 40 or begin 10 years younger than the age of the youngest affected relative when they were diagnosed. When should colonoscopies be repeated? How often should they be done? 
Now, the recommendations on this slide do not apply to people who have hereditary colorectal cancer syndromes. If you've never had a prior polyp and no family history of colon cancer, colonoscopy is recommended every 10 years. If your colonoscopist finds just one or two small adenomas, they could have you come back in five years or as long as 10 years. If you have more than two, in other words, three to 10 precancerous adenomas, you should come back in three years for your next colonoscopy. If you have more than 10, you should come back much less than that. And in fact, if you have 10 or more adenomas, you should consider seeing a genetic counselor for a possible genetic syndrome. If you have one or more large precancerous or advanced adenomas, come back in three years. <clears throat> and uh, if you have a single precancerous polyp greater than two centimeters, you should be coming back in three to six months. Well, how can I tell if I have a hereditary syndrome? One in 300 people carry a mutation for Lynch syndrome, which is the most common colon cancer hereditary syndrome. People with Lynch syndrome are also predisposed to a variety of other cancers, most commonly endometrial cancer or uterine cancer, but also stomach cancer, ovarian cancer, and less likely biliary cancer or cancer of the bile ducts, urinary tract cancers, small bowel cancers, and brain tumors. If you, the best way to, to get some idea as to whether you may have a syndrome is to first look at your personal history and your family history for colorectal cancer or Lynch cancers, particularly under age 50. <clears throat> if there's two or more people in your family closely related with colorectal cancer or Lynch syndromes, at any age, consider the possibility of an inherited colon, ca colon cancer syndrome. If you have 10 or more precancerous polyps, consider an inherited cancer syndrome. Also look at immediate family members who may have already been diagnosed with a hereditary colon cancer syndrome, such as Lynch familial adenomatous polyposis, which is FAP, pooch yeager syndrome, Cowden's, or MAP, which is um, otherwise known as MYH-associated polyposis. If you have family members with these conditions, see a geneticist and get tested. If you have a family history of colorectal cancer or an inherited colorectal cancer syndrome, the intervals between colonoscopies are much shorter. If you don't have a syndrome but do have a family history of colorectal cancer or advanced polyps, you should begin at age 40 or 10 years younger than the age of the earliest diagnosis of your family member and have your colonoscopies every five years. If you have Lynch syndrome, begin screening early between ages 20 and 25 and continue screening for the rest of your life every one to two years to help you prevent getting a colorectal cancer. If you have familial adenomatous polyposis, screening begins in puberty and it continues every year for as long as you continue to have your colon. With familial adenomatous polyposis, as you may recall, the risk of getting a colorectal cancer can approach 100%, and many of these people require having their colons out before that happens. Keep in mind that even with hereditary syndromes, proper screening can help you prevent colorectal cancer. Thank you very much.